Chapter Two of The Caves of Fear by John Blaine. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. Chapter Two: The Cipher Message. Barby, Rick, and Scotty were in the library when Hartson Brandt walked in. They were reduced to the point of staring at each other helplessly because of the magnitude of the task that confronted them. The famous scientist, who looked like an older version of his son, greeted them with a smile. What is this, a meeting of the Silent Three? I can't even remember finding you all together when one of you wasn't talking. Rick handed him the cable. What do you make of that, Dad? Hartson Brent scanned it quickly. From Chava, in Singapore, and in Cipher. Am I supposed to gather that you don't have the key to the cipher? That's right, Scotty said. He held up a heavy volume called Cryptography for the Student. It was the only book on the subject in the scientist's library. We've been going through this, trying to find some kind of clue. Honest, it's impossible. There are so many codes and ciphers, Barby added. Dozens, and it says some of them can only be broken by days of work, by experts. There's not an expert in the house, either, Rick concluded. I didn't think, when Bill called us up about it, that Chato would use a code we couldn't figure out, but I didn't expect a page like that. Hartson Brent read through the cable again. How do you know you can't figure it out? Perhaps a little reasoning will clear the air. Chata must have put a key in the message somewhere. How about this L in front of his name? That's right, Barbie said excitedly. That must mean something, because his name is Chata Sundararaman. There isn't an L in it anywhere. The scientist handed the cable back to Rick. I'm about as curious as I can get, he said, but I refuse to think any more about it until you hand me the clear version. I agree that Chato wouldn't send a code he couldn't solve, so my advice is put the code book away. You won't need it, I'm sure. This isn't any code you'll find in there. He started out of the room, then paused at the door, his eyes twinkling. Will you have dinner at the table with us? Or shall I ask Mother to break out some emergency rations so you can stay on the job? We'll eat with the family, Scotty replied. We can keep on thinking while we eat, can't we? Rick watched his father wink at Barbie, then walk toward the kitchen. Dad's right, he announced. He must be. So let's put the book back and start figuring this out. The answer probably is easy as pie once we find the key. How about starting with that odd letter? Scotty asked. That has to mean something. L is the twelfth letter in the alphabet, Barbie offered. Does that mean anything? Rick shook his head. Not to me, but let's start from there, anyway. Maybe the twelfth group of numbers has a clue. He counted rapidly across the number groups. That group is four three nine nine six nine three. Now what? Scotty suggested. Substitute letters for the numbers. That would make it D C I I F I C. That doesn't mean anything. Maybe you counted the wrong way, Barbie said thoughtfully. Count down the columns instead of across. Rick did so. That's eight three three seven three seven three substitute and it comes out let's see h c c g c g c nothing there either scotty had a pad of paper and a pencil and was making idle doodles i'm trying to recall when did chada learn anything about codes rick thought for a moment he never did that i know of he said finally. Barbie stood up. Well, I'm going to shower and change before dinner, she announced, but I'll keep thinking. I have an idea that talking about it won't help much. 
if dad and rick are right about his using a code we're sure to know it must be staring us in the face and we're too blind to see it good idea rick agreed let's break this up and each think about it if we search our memories maybe we'll come up with a clue barby went upstairs and scotty retired to his favorite seat on the porch but rick felt that he could think better on his feet a glance at his watch told him he had over an hour and a half before dinner he waved at scotty and walked across the grass toward the gray stone laboratory buildings professor weiss was in his office working on some mathematical theory he was developing it was a way over rick's head for a moment he thought of posing the problem to the little professor then thought better of it and passed by the lab on the south side he skirted the woods and crossed pirate's field so called because local legend said the famed woman pirate ann bonnie had once landed there with her gang of cutthroats he paused for a moment and studied the fused sand left by the terrific heat when the first moon rocket was launched but the barren patch gave him no inspiration staying on the shore path he walked slowly toward the back of the island and presently came out at the tidal flats the tide was out leaving the rocks exposed he sat down at the edge of the low bluff above the flats and stared into the patches of water it was a hard job trying to recall every detail of his friendship with the little hindu boy but he tried it had started in bombay when rick and scotty were on their way to tibet with vice and zircon to set up the radar relay station for message transmission via the moon when their equipment was stolen it was chada who took the lead in finding it again they had been amused by the beggar boy who had educated himself with an old copy of the world almanac his ability to quote anything from the alm in ak as he called it in english that was sometimes pretty funny was really astonishing then at the lost city he had more than proved his courage and loyalty and the spindrifters had sponsored his visit to america as a reward for a while chada had attended school in america then he had gone to the pacific with the spindrift expedition to quangara island after salvaging the remains of an ancient temple from one hundred fathoms of water not to mention the treasure that was found the spindrifters had returned home but chada had elected to remain in hawaii with professor warren of the pacific ethnographic society later he had gone with the warren scientific expedition to the south seas and barby rick and scotty had joined the party in new caledonia after completing part of the expedition's work the trawler tarpon had returned to new caledonia where the young people had solved the mystery of the phantom shark when the three spin drifters returned home chada had taken air passage to bombay to see his family i can't remember all we talked about rick muttered to himself we talked about everything and anything except codes i can't remember that we ever talked about codes he got up noticing that the crew of builders were in their barge returning to the mainland for the night they were trucking materials to a point on the shore near spindrift using an old wood road then taking the stuff the rest of the way by barge it was getting on to dinner time he took the woods path back passing by the new cottages they were nearing completion the outsides already finished beyond the cottages was the farm run by the huggins family mr huggins was just herding the island's milk cows into the barn for milking rick kicked at a nearby tree either i'm dumb or it isn't as simple as we think it ought to be he said aloud then went on into the house scotty and barby had done no better they gathered at the family table with long faces and barby placed the disturbing cable in the middle of the table as a centerpiece if we look at it long enough maybe we'll get inspiration she said professor julius weiss 
the only one of the three staff scientists who was at home at the moment, picked up the cable and examined it. A cipher, eh? He adjusted his glasses. It certainly looks complicated. Any ideas? Rick asked hopefully. The little mathematician shook his head. No, Rick. I could give you the cube root of the square of the sum of the numbers, or anything like that, but I'm afraid I wouldn't even know how to start breaking the code, he added. John probably could. He had some experiences with codes while in the Navy, I believe. John was Professor John Gordon. He was on an extended trip to New Mexico, serving as a consultant to the Navy's guided missiles projects. The third scientist, Professor Hobart Zircon, was giving a five-week series of lectures in nuclear physics at Yale. I'm afraid Professor Gordon is too far away to help us on this, Rick said. Mrs. Brandt came in, bringing a heavily laden dish of fresh corn on the cob. Behind her trotted a shaggy little dog. Rick snapped his fingers. Here, Diz. Dismal ran over and barked at his young master. Then he rolled over on his back and played dead, his own trick. Rick grinned. Did you bring him along as an advisor, Mom? I'll bet he'd be as good at solving this as any of us. Mrs. Brandt smiled. From what your father told me, I think he might at that. But... Why all the long faces? I think it's exciting getting a code message from Chada. Why, this is the first time we've had a code problem on the island since the moon rocket. Mrs. Brandt couldn't have caused a more sudden reaction had she tossed a lighted firecracker into the middle of the roast. Barbie knocked over her water glass. Scotty gasped. Great grasshoppers! A book code! Rick strangled on a sip of milk, and when he could get his breath again, he ran around the table to his mother, kissed her soundly, and lifted her hand high in token of victory. The new champ, he proclaimed. Mom, you're a genius. But Rick, I didn't say anything except... You said just enough, dear, Hartson Brent replied. We all had the answer right in that second because you gave us a clue. Do you remember the code our former friend used when he was sending messages off the island? The former friend Hartson Brandt referred to was a member of the staff who had turned renegade and helped Manfred Vessel's gang in their efforts to build a moon rocket using the spindrift design in order to win the Stone Ridge grant of two million dollars. The trader scientists had used code messages to keep the gang informed of new developments on Spindrift. While he had used the cloak of false friendship to slow up the building of the Spindrift rocket. He used a double code, Rick explained. Part of it was a regular cipher, but the first step was a book code. I do remember, Mrs. Brandt exclaimed. He used a copy of that book. Hartson's friend wrote, what was it? Psychiatry simplified. The code was numbers that gave the page of the book, and the position of the word on the page, and unless you found the book, as Rick and Scotty did, you couldn't break the code. Barbie jumped up in her excitement. And I know what book Chata was using. The rest of the group spoke as one. The World Almanac. Scotty ran for the library, Rick on his heels. We told him about that code, Scotty said. Now I remember when, too. It was right after we got back from India, when we were showing him around the lab. I remember, too, Rick agreed. We were telling him how the gang used my plane, with me flying it to smuggle their coded messages, and he asked us about it because he had never heard of codes before. They reached the shelf that held the almanac and stopped short. Because of the year-to-year -year news summaries in the famous annual, 
Hartson Brandt had kept each edition as a reference source. There were over a dozen of them on the shelf. They're all different, Rick said. The pages change each year. Which one did he use? Scotty's forehead furrowed. Which one did he memorize? It was an old one, but I can't remember the date. Got it, Rick said. Remember the letter L, the twelfth letter of the alphabet? It must be the 1912 edition. Scotty surveyed the shelf. Which we don't have, he said. Rick groaned. No! Hartson Brandt called from the dining room. Haven't you solved that cipher yet? The boys walked dejectedly back to join the others. Rick explained that the right volume was missing. The spindrift files just didn't go back that far. Sit down and eat your dinner, Hartson Brandt said. He sliced roast for them, his eyes thoughtful. Something's wrong with your reasoning, he said, as he filled Rick's plate. Would Chata have a 1912 edition with him in Singapore? I doubt it. More likely he'd have a more recent one. But the letter L has to mean something, Barby protested. What could it mean but 12? Rick asked, and the answer stuck him before the words were out. He shouted, I know, it could mean 50. L is the Roman numeral 50. Barby clapped her hands. Scotty reached over and pounded Rick on the back. That's it, Hartson Brandt said approvingly. I'll make a wager on it. Chada used the 1950 edition. Rick pushed back his chair, but the scientist's voice stopped him. Let's rest on our laurels, Rick. Finish dinner first, then we'll all retire to the library and work it out. Because they were burning with impatience, the three younger members of the Spindrift family did not enjoy the meal. But they made a pretense of eating. Then, an eternity later, Hartson Brent took the last sip of his coffee and grinned at Rick. Shall we get to it? Shall we? Barbie led the way, holding the cable high. The first part was easy. Since most pages in the almanac had three numbers, they assumed that the first three numbers in each code group referred to the page. Similarly, they assumed that the second two numbers referred to the line. That left two numbers for the position of the word on the line. With nervous fingers, Rick turned to page 521 of the 1950 edition and counted down 30 lines. He hesitated over the subtitles, then decided to count them, too. At the proper line, he looked up at Scotty and Barbie, who were watching over his shoulder. But there are two columns. Don't worry about the columns, Scotty advised. I don't think Chada would pay any attention to the columns, because it would mean extra numbers in each group. Count right across and don't pay any attention to the dividing line. Rick did so. It doesn't come out right, he complained. The number is 39, but there are only 17 words on the whole line. Barbie sighed. Maybe we're wrong all the way round. I don't think so, Arson Brandt said. He was sitting in a comfortable chair, smoking an after-dinner pipe. The logic of the thing appeals to me. Do you suppose Chada would know about nulls? What's a null? Scotty asked. In cryptography, it's a number or a letter thrown in for the sake of appearance or to confuse. Chada might know, Rick said. That brown head of his is crammed full of more odd chunks of information than you could imagine. But if there's a null in this, which figure is it? Try it both ways, Barbie urged. Here, I'll do it. She counted across the line. The third word is 17. She wrote it down. The ninth word is come. Could be either, 
Scotty mused, but come sounds more likely. Let's try the next group. That was 6231581. Rick turned to page 623 and counted down 15 lines, including the title. However, he didn't count the page heading. The heading was on the same line as the page number. Both were above a line drawn across the top of the page, and it seemed sensible to start below the line. There aren't 81 words on the lines, he said, so that means another no, maybe. The first word is both, and the eighth word is may. Barbie wrote them down. It all makes sense, she pointed out. It could be 17 may, or come both. Keep going, Scotty urged. Try another one. The third group gave them a choice of Cheyenne, which seemed unlikely, or bad. He couldn't be talking about Cheyenne, Rick said. The word must be bad. That means the first figure of the pair is the null, because it's the second figure that stands for bad. Sounds reasonable, Scotty agreed. Keep plugging. So far, the probable words were come both bad. Page 276 in the fourth group turned out to be a table of atomic weights. Line 86 was the element tantalum. If the first figure of the last pair was assumed to be a null, the word was the symbol for tantalum, ta. Rick stared at it. Something's wrong. This doesn't make sense. Barbie asked impatiently, How do we know? Rick yielded and moved to the next group. It gave the word rubles. That's Russian money, he said. The trio looked at it in bewilderment. Then, Scotty suddenly let out a yell of laughter. I've got it! Can't you see? Ta and rubles go together. Ta, rubles. Troubles! Then they were all howling with joy. Leave it to Chada to dream up something like that, Rick thought. So far, the message made sense. Come both bad troubles. He turned the pages and counted feverishly. The sixth group gave am, the seventh in. The eighth group gave the message an ominous tone. Come both bad troubles am in danger. The scientists and Mrs. Brandt were looking over Rick's shoulder now, too. The ninth group stopped them for a moment because the pair of figures standing for the word was fourteen. If the figure one was a null, the word was the, but there were more than fourteen words in the line, and the fourteenth was my. Rick looked at the faces around him. I think it's my because he must have had a reason for using nulls. If I were making up the code, I'd use them because sometimes there are enough words in a line, so you'd need two figures and sometimes not. But you always have to put down two figures so the groups will be even. Good thinking, Rick's father complimented him. Go ahead on that basis, but hurry up. The suspense is awful. There was a chorus of agreements. The next word was boss. He was working then, Scotty guessed. That must be it, if he has a boss. Rick hurried to the next group. It produced Carl. Page 439, the 96th line, gave Bradley. Then the boss's name was Carl Bradley. Hartson Brandt gave a muffled exclamation. Scotty turned quickly. Do you know that name, Dad? Yes, but let's get the rest of the message. Quickly, Rick. The words appeared in rapid succession, with a pause now and then to solve a new difficulty. Once, the lines across the columns were not even, and a ruler had to be laid across to find the word. Again, a null appeared as the first number in the page group. 
Chada had used it because the page was 51, and he needed a third figure to round out the group. That was easy to spot because the group read 951, and the book had only 912 pages. In the last series of groups, Rick came across another double word like Tarubles. This time, be and where combined to make beware. Then, the very last word stopped them for a moment. It was Umbra. What's that? Scotty asked. The shadow cast by the moon during an eclipse of the sun, Julius Weiss answered. Or part of it, rather. There are two shadows, the Umbra and the Penumbra. Barby ran for a dictionary and leafed through the pages quickly. I have it, she said. Listen, it's from the Latin for shadow, and it means a shade or shadow. Shadow it is, Rick said, and wrote it down. Then slowly he read the full message to the serious group around him. Come both, bad troubles, am in danger. My boss, Carl Bradley, disappeared. Government will ask scientific father do special work. Must take. Get jobs. Meet me Hong Kong. Golden Mouse. Watch Chinese with glass eye. He dangerous. And beware. Long shadow. End of chapter 2